The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. Let's go, baby! Are you ready for a break? Uh, yes. Are you ready for a break? Absolutely. Ready for a break? Yeah, and um, so much for that. It's time for The Break on DallasCowboys.com. We were on the break! With Nick Eatman, David Hellman, Ambar Garcia, and Derek Eagleton. It is Wednesday, April 24th, 2019, season 15, episode number six. Welcome to another edition of The Break. We are live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star, and it's draft week. Cowboys 2019 NFL Draft is upon us. Uh, it starts tomorrow night. Uh, we'll have wall-to-wall coverage for you guys across all of our channels, DallasCowboys.com, Cowboys Mobile, Cowboys Connected TV app. Um, basically, everywhere you can go to get content, we'll be there, and we'll be giving you guys wall-to-wall coverage. Welcome to the show, Nick, Dave, and, and in Amber. Spanish. And in Spanish. Yeah. We're doing so, wall-to-wall in Spanish? I don't know about wall-to-wall. <laughs> as far as I can reach, you know, I can't reach both sides of the wall. But you'll but be giving us some content. We'll have some stuff Somos in Cowboys, for those of you that don't know. <laughs> yeah. Go check out SomosCowboys.com. You can also get access to that Spanish content on our mobile app, Cowboys Mobile. How's everybody this morning? Great. From this awesome. midday. Good. We Great. ready for draft? Yes. Yeah, you've been so working excited. on this for a while, Dave. It's like Christmas. I love it. This is one of the best weeks of the year. I think this is my three favorite days that don't actually involve football being played. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not the games. No. I mean, football season in general. Labor Day to Christmas is better than the rest of the year always. But this is nice. Good. So let's talk a little bit about draft. And I wanted to take it a little different direction, seeing as this is not the draft show. So don't expect that you're going to get a whole ton of you know, here's who the Cowboys should be looking at in the sixth round. But what I wanted to do, I actually saw this article this week. Um, and actually, I was listening to our sister station, uh, W105.3, The Fan here in Dallas. And they were doing a similar thing. But there was a, it was all based on this article um, that, I, that, was, that I read that Bucky Brooks produced on NFL.com. And uh, the, content- the whole contention of the article was that uh, based on his experience and the other guy he works with, Daniel Jeremiah, who's also a former scout, both of them being former scouts, um, they kind of came up with this formula of what they said a Super Bowl contending team should be. Here are the ingredients that a Super Bowl contending team should be in today's NFL. Um, and so I wanted to talk about, number one, that formula that they put together. Uh, but then also, in, as a part of the article, they named five teams in the NFL that they feel like are Super Bowl contender ready based upon this formula, one of which being the 2019 Dallas Cowboys. And they gave some names as to some of the ingredients that they thought kind of made up this whole uh, this whole you know concoction of what a team would look like. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. So let's start first with kind of his overall idea of what should be in a Super Bowl contending team. And I want to get your opinions on whether you think um, what you think of the actual setup, right? So he says, Super Bowl contending team should, one, have a franchise quarterback. Number two, should have three offensive linemen. And when I mean by offensive linemen, three really good offensive linemen. He calls them blue players. Uh, these are players that you would consider top 10 to 15 to 20, depending on the position in the NFL. Uh, but three offensive linemen, three offensive playmakers. And by the way, you can't have multiple guys. in. The, you can't have a guy in, the, in two different positions. So if your quarterback is your quarterback, you can't consider him one of the playmakers, right? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, then you have two pass rushers, and then you finalize, finally have three defensive playmakers. What do you guys think of that? think that seems like a bit much. Do you think that, do you argue the point of whether you need some of those some of those people? I mean... On oh, three playmakers on the offense out, outside the quarterback and yes. the three offensive linemen. Yes. Okay. So three skill positions yeah. that are playmakers, and then on defense, three playmakers that are not your two pass rushers. I, I don't like to be that guy that always just, just d- disagrees with stuff, but I, I just think but, that it's a very black and white way to look at it. Uh, I guarantee you there are people listening to this show right now that are like, what about the coach? Where does that factor in on all this thing? That's a good point. Um, but, I, I, you know, yeah, those things sound pretty good. Uh, the, the difference for me, let's start with number one, the franchise quarterback. Because how many franchise quarterbacks are there? You know, like... Is my franchise quarterback better than your? Fr- I mean, you're calling Kirk Cousins a franchise quarterback in Minnesota because you're paying for it, but he's not helping you win like Tom Brady is as a franchise quarterback. So I, I yeah, you know, is Dak a franchise quarterback? Well, let me give you let me give you some perspective on that. Of the five teams he mentioned, he mentioned the Patriots, and this is where you get interesting: the Cleveland Browns, 
the Los Angeles Rams, the Dallas Cowboys, and the Chicago Bears. Four of those five are not considered top three to top five quarterbacks in the NFL. However, he identifies them as franchise quarterbacks, which makes me think his definition of a franchise quarterback is not necessarily that as much as it is who you have a guy that you know is your guy at quarterback. Whether that's whether he has flaws, we know that he has flaws, but he is your guy. Like this is a guy you're committed to, mm. and you feel like by and large he can get you to the promised land, right? He's got to have pieces. Maybe that's the truth. But he's just a quarterback that you feel like you're committed to and you think he can get you there with the right things around him. Yeah, and that I mean, that conversation has become so skewed and like it's it's a meme at this point, like the old, you know, decade old joke about is Joe Flacco elite? Like, you know, is a franchise quarterback a guy that can make every play on his own and win you games that you're not supposed to win and he will keep you relevant no matter what? Or is a franchise quarterback a guy that you trust to steer your organization in the right direction i think it's a wide definition and not everybody has the same one which is why it's perfectly logical for me to think that daniel jeremiah considers dak a franchise quarterback and a bunch of people listening to this don't um yeah. but the recipe i mean th that's that's not that's not groundbreaking stuff you need a quarterback right. you need to protect your quarterback your quarterback needs weapons to get the ball to you have to rush the passer you have to have guys that can make plays on the ball when the ball comes out especially in the stand that age. sounds like, like a good football team and a good football team is a, usually a super bowl contender right. so th th yeah he's he's breaking it down and it's it's april and and he's doing his homework and and i get it like that's that's a that's a well written thing and he's now identifying teams that are on there that that's awesome um I, I, yeah, I, th I agree with Dave. It's not really groundbreaking, but I do think coaching is is a part of it. Um, and then there's some intangibles thing too. You know, you, kicker and stuff like that. You got to have a guy that's not gonna. You know, I don't know if kicker has to make you elite, but uh, you can lose games if if you. You know, the Rams certainly got into the Super Bowl because they had a kicker. You know, right. so uh, there's some other factors there. But uh, that's interesting. I think it just starts with quarterback. I mean, like you said, is is this quarterback elite? Is he good enough to get there? But if you got those three offensive linemen and three playmakers on offense, and then and then your defense is doing its job, you know I don't even know how you even need a franchise quarterback. You just need a quarterback that's not going to mess it up. I actually I haven't read this article, so I don't know for sure. But I can lump it into two different categories: is there's the teams, there's and there's the New Englands of the world, and the New Orleans. And New Orleans has a hell of a roster. Don't get me wrong. Oh, Green Bay. I know the Packers won six games last year. I don't care. There's that category of quarterback where you're in the conversation no matter what, Seattle now. Um, and then there's a group of teams, and the ones you listed come to mind, of you've got all the pieces and enough of it is cheap that you've got the cap space that it makes sense. And I don't like to think of it in terms of like a one-off. I mean, you know, the Saints probably should have been in the Super Bowl and fl fluke circumstances kept them out. Um, and that happens every year. This is such a parody driven league. I mean, you know, Des caught it, right? Or even, you know, the Packers won that game and then they're up 20 points in the fourth quarter and they don't go to the Super Bowl. Like, mm -hmm. I prefer to think of it in a two, three year window. And I think the teams you listed are all set up to be very successful in this two, three year window. And I definitely think the Cowboys are one of them. And I think the quarterback and the head coach, you mentioned the head coach, I think those are the two parts to me that can affect the rest of the list. Depending on how good they are, you may have to have less of these other parts. If you have a Tom Brady and a Belichick together, then to me, although he makes the arguments that they have all those other pieces, I think all those other pieces would be moderate pieces on other teams. Right. But because you've got such a great head coach, in my opinion, first, and then you have a great quarterback, it allows you to get away with using lesser players in some of those other roles, and you're still able to win Super Bowls. And, and I think what Dave was saying is, is there's a few of those teams with those quarterbacks like that that can do that. Right. Uh, the Saints, though... To me, seem are they on that list? Actually, they're on the list of teams that are close but not quite there. And his whole argument with them was they don't have the offensive line. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have three of those guys. Which, when we get into ours a little bit, I think you can start making some arguments whether the Cowboys have, right now, as we stand, do they have three great offensive linemen? Do they have three guys that at their positions are considered across the league some of the best? And I don't know if you can make that argument right now, but we'll get into that a little bit more. I can. I, I will. I okay, so. good. Let's, let's have that conversation, and let's talk right uh, about these different positions on the Cowboys. Uh, franchise quarterback, obviously, he says Dak. Um, three offensive linemen, Tyron Smith, Zach Martin, Travis Frederick. Fre Travis Frederick. Obviously, the question mark there is Travis Frederick. Um, offensive playmakers, he says Zeke. 
Amari Cooper, and Jason Witten, which I thought was a bit curious, but we'll talk about that. Um, two pass rushers, obviously, Demarcus Lawrence and Robert Quinn. They have other guys that could potentially step up, so I think this is an area that probably makes some sense. Um, and then three defensive playmakers, Jalen Smith, Leighton Van Der Esch, and he throws in Byron Jones. No. Byron Jones is a good player. He's not I don't know playmaker. if he's a playmaker. He's so, not a playmaker. He he, he uh, prevents plays, which is really important at that position, but he's not making plays right, uh, right now. And I think that's what the hold – not the hold up, but I think that's what the hesitation is to pay him a lot of money. But um, – Really good player though, and, and and he got into the to the the Pro Bowl without an interception, which is which is unique, you yeah. know, for this team. Um, but I don't know if he's a playmaker. But I, I, you know, that's that's still it. I mean, a good. He's a really good player. This is an example, I think, in his article where he describes the blue players, as he calls them, the players that are top ten at their position around the league. I think this is a situation where you could have a Byron Jones who could be considered a blue player, let me, but may not necessarily be a playmaker. Let me change that. You know what? If you're throwing a deep ball on third and nine, and he's knocking the ball down, or he's contesting it, and you're getting off the field, you made a play. You know, so I'm not going to call him not a playmaker. He's not getting an interception or a turnover, and he knows that. He says that's the number one thing he's got to change this year. But he's making plays by getting off the field. So let me let enough me. that you call him a playmaker, though. See, I I think you were right the first time, and all due respect to Byron. I'll be the one to bring up Earl Thomas this time, since you usually do it. But oh, yeah. who? Oh, it was coming. It was coming. Go back to week three in Seattle. Right. Like yeah. when was the last time the Cowboys had a DB that just completely true. took over a game like that? And that's it what he's defining happened. as a playmaker. And that's yeah. not on this roster. That right? is it's true. not right. Not now. in the secondary. Nope. Yeah, yeah I mean uh, Jalen and, and Layton, hundred percent. I'm very yeah. comfortable listing them as playmakers. They force fumbles. They intercept the ball. Think they make key stops. Layton had more interceptions than any DB on this team, yeah. did he not? Yeah. Or tied? Yeah. Like I mean, yeah, the, go for it. Y'all, y'all deserve that title. I don't feel comfortable listing a DB on this team as a playmaker. I think Byron Jones is a hell of a player. I hesitate to put that label on him. Okay, so that's one position that we have a question. I don't know. Mark. Like to me, that's like the cherry on top type of stuff. Like I, I'm, I feel good enough with him. Yes, you want interceptions. You want them to get the ball back, but Wait, and I think he deserved to go to the Pro Bowl. I kudos to the league for having the wherewithal to give him that without the turnovers, because there's more to life than turnovers. Coverage is important, but. In a league where, in a league where like seventy-five to eighty percent of the games are a coin flip, that is kind of important. You need a guy who can give you a short field once every other game, or do something like that. You know, I think, yeah. You know, the, go ahead. You were saying something earlier. No, I was just gonna mention, like, as far as corner, he he would be the one that I feel the best, like in recent time, like that I feel good about mm-hmm. having him on the field. Like the Cowboys haven't really had a good corner like that to where you feel comfortable enough. And he was able to make that happen last year. Yeah. And, and I think the, the stretch there is that having a team with five dynamic players is that's a lot on defense. And that's kind of what he's asking. Two, two pass rushers and then three playmakers were – if those guys are doing their job where we call them pass rushers, then they are playmakers as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, so to, fi- so to fi- not consider Demarcus Lawrence a playmaker. <laughs> Quite frankly, kind of Demarcus Lawrence is the best playmaker on yeah. this team. Because when you factor in what he does in the yeah. run game, he's the best so, playmaker on this team. So they're they're good there. They're, you know, he's asking for five difference-making players, and whether or not he's getting an interception or not, he's making a difference for sure. He made it all pro, Byron Jones. So. Yeah, I, I, I think we're, we're there. He's not a catalytic playmaker, but he's definitely doing his job. Okay, let's go back up to the offensive line. And they had, he says, you need three dynamic offensive linemen. I think as of two years ago, there wouldn't even be a question. We would just gloss right over this and move on to the next thing. But I do think with Travis Frederick having missed the season, with him coming back from an injury that is not your typical, hey, I broke this bone and it takes this long for the bone to heal, um, because there's a lot of unpredictability, if that's a word, uh, around this kind of ailment, do you guys feel like right now the Cowboys can feel confident in the fact that they've got three difference-making offensive linemen on this team? You're right. I want to. I mean, like, If anybody deserves the benefit of the doubt, it's Travis Frederick. He's definitely in that category of player, but you're right. This isn't a broken bone or a ligament, and it's, and it's something that bears watching. I... 
have every confidence he can work himself back into being that caliber of player, but I hesitate to just assume it'll happen, you know? But, but you know, here's where I will argue w- with that notion there is that if, if I'm sitting here with, with a, you know, a right guard, a right tackle, and a center that are all pro, let's somewhere, some AFC team, but my left tackle and my left guard are, are issues, you know, and I have an Eric Flowers type of guy on the left side where, you know, I, I've got to give help to all the time. Then, yeah, I got three studs over here. I mean, Joe Thomas was great for years for with Cleveland, but I don't know who else was good with him. I would, would rather, I would rather not have three All Pro guys. I'd rather have five guys that are pretty good that were all rated first round picks. You know, Lyle Collins, very, very serviceable, if not good, on the right side. Connor Williams as a rookie. If this is the the floor for Connor Williams, he's going to be fine. So. I would rather have five guys like that than than just say, do I have three all pros? Maybe, maybe not. But I know I, my five is probably as good as anyone else. You know, so it is a unit more than any other yeah, unit on the football field. That's where that I would probably work as a unit. Question that a little bit. I I get you need some elite guys that you don't have to worry about Zach Bard. You don't have to worry about that. But and knowing that when a player gets hurt. You, you're going to be fine with the backup. Like we saw Sack Martin go out. Obviously, Travis Frederick, Frederick was out the whole season. So Philo, when he went out. So it, it, it was good this year when you saw all these different types of injuries that you had a backup that was able to come in and do the job. Yeah, you're and quite right. quite frankly, at the center position, you got one that you feel pretty good I, about. Yeah. He played all last year and played pretty well. Looney, Suofilo, and Fleming on top of the five that are starters – I don't think there's a team in the league from that. one to eight that's better than that. Yeah, but they were still second in the league in sacks allowed, which that is something that will have to be better if this is a team that's going to take the all important. And they step. couldn't they couldn't move those Rams guys out of the way. They really the couldn't. That's, I mean, tra- Travis Frederick playing at his normal level could be so big for this team, and I. I hope for the Cowboys and for him that that you know this will be a natural progression. You know, there's debate. You know, people that have had Guillain-Barré syndrome are like, this is a thing that takes a year or more to really get back to right. speed. But then you're also like, well, Travis Frederick's an NFL athlete. He's got access to to rehab and and he's got the genetics that might make this an easier transition for him. But I've heard an NFL athlete who's gone through this yeah. same, exact same thing. It takes so a year to come back. We will we will have to see. Like I said, like I want to just assume that he will plug right back in and be an All Pro. I hope that happens, but I think it would be a mistake to just assume that that's the case in late April. Do you think because of his stature on this team as one of the leaders that the Cowboys, even if he isn't really back to being himself and he's maybe not even the best center that they got you think they would actually make him a backup this year and let him keep working his way back or do you think that because of his stature they're putting him out there if he can go I I think Travis is is the type of player and person that won't allow that if he can't do what he needs to do uh physically and and he's even said that in in his in his um interviews here recently he had a story that Rob Phillips wrote on our site about right now it's great I'm, I'm making progress but we don't know until we really get the pads on and i have to go block antoine woods and, and keep him from getting back there by the way that's when we first started realizing something we didn't know what was wrong but we knew right. it wasn't travis frederick right? right and so you know he he's he's like let's see we'll see what happens and so i i don't think if it's if he's not better than joe looney i don't i mean what's jason garrett holding on for i mean he, he's got to make sure that that his job's on, on the, I mean, you know, th- there's no <laughs> playing favorites anymore. I the mean. flip, the flip side <laughs> you of got that, bigger problems right now. Let's go. Yeah. The flip side of that too is, you know, maybe Travis Frederick, who's at 75% is still better than a lot of centers. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah. Maybe. And that's the question. Like what percentage does he have to be back to where he's better than what you got from Looney? That's the question. Great question. And, and that'll be, a, and that's not, but the thing is, that's not a, that's not a black and white thing. No. That is a lot of that is based upon kind of just your feel, what you see, and you're kind of making some, you know, you're kind of but, extrapolating what you think it'll be in the regular season. But also his awareness and stuff, he's sitting there in the middle of the of the line. How, how much is he going to help Dak? How much is he going to help Connor Williams over here? Just having him around is, I mean, I'm not, nothing no, against I get Looney. That. I get that. Here's my other part to that, though, is. I think Looney's a fairly smart guy. He is. After doing a whole season, how much better is he at that now than he would have been Which, a year ago? Right? He's an all pro. 
I always, yeah, <laughs> I always struggle I, I with hate it. Saying that. I love that guy. He's so <laughs> awesome. Too, but go ahead. No, just you know, people love to look at it like a game of Madden or you know, like NCAA yeah. football is like. All right, you go What's to the off, rating. You go to the off season, and it's the off season, so like you're gonna get better. Like yeah. he's gonna get seven points better, and he's <laughs> back from injury. Like that's how it works in right. video games, and that's not how it works in real life. And exactly. that's always something you have to keep in mind. All right. All right, we're gonna take our first break. We'll come back, and I have a question for you guys around the three offensive playmakers. Jason Witten was on that list. I want to know: Do you guys think he should be? Should the Cowboys consider him to be on that list? We'll talk about that when we come back. This is DallasCowboys.com radio. Kaboo, Texas is three days, six stages, over 100 artists, including The Killers, Lionel Richie, Leonard Skinner, Ms. Lauren Hill, Kid Rock, Alanis Morissette, Little Big Town, The Eight Vet Brothers, Counting Crows, Pitbull, Sting, The Black Eyed Peas, and the list goes on. Don't miss Kaboo, Texas. Single day and three day passes are on sale now. Visit K-A-A-B-O-O. Texas.com to get your passes today. If you're like me and you love... I mean, if you have a... ...thing, then cutting the cord is scary. But then I found out I could switch to DirecTV now and still get the live sports I love. No satellite needed, no bulky hardware, no annual contract, just... Get the live sports you love. Try DirecTV now for $10 a month for three months. Visit DirecTVnow.com. DirecTV Now. More for your thing. That's our thing. Use code REALDEAL. Limited time. Price for a little, little package. After three months, we use monthly at full price. Currently minimum $40 unless canceled. Prices may change. New subscribers only. Cancel any time. Content varies by package and may be limited. Restrictions apply. You want the most interesting, up-to-the-minute Dallas Cowboys news straight from the star in Frisco? How about exclusive and on command? That's right. News and nuggets you can't find anywhere else. With our exclusive Cowboys content on Alexa, you can have all the answers secrets stories and more what's steven jones thinking during a game what's joe looney's favorite pregame meal we take your questions to cowboys players and coaches and you can hear the answers directly back to you just say alexa open dallas cowboys star sports tours is the only official fan travel partner of the dallas cowboys offering exclusive game weekend travel packages with sideline access and photo ops with current players alumni and cheerleaders that's not all though you'll get to talk ex and O's with Senior Director of Player Personnel Will McClay and of course with yours truly me, Brian Broadus. You can trust the official fan travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys and with us, you'll travel like a pro. Visit CowboysTravel.com to book your travel package today. While a player could look good on paper, it's when he's out on the field that you really find out what he's made of. That's why the Cowboys rely on more than just stats and scouting reports when building their team. When picking a tractor, it's why you should rely on more than just specs and features. You've got to take it out and put it to the test. The Cowboys did when they named John Deere their official tractor. Experience one for yourself. Visit myjohndeeredealer.com slash football. Back to the break. Welcome back. We're in the second segment of The Break live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. Uh, we're talking about the draft in a roundabout way. We're going to get to the draft, I promise. We're going to have some questions here about the draft and how this Good. fits to this. But, <laughs> Didn't but do all starting, this work for nothing. We're starting Boring. by talking about this from the standpoint of how... Wow. Be careful. <laughs> Brian I would say, get You pissed. might not want to say that around Brian. Um, you, we're, gonna, we're talking about this from the standpoint, though, of how... Um, a team is constructed, how a Super Bowl caliber team is constructed from the eyes of in the draft, a, former, a former scout, uh, Bucky Brooks, who writes for NFL.com, an article he put out. So we've talked about uh, kind of what we think about the franchise quarterback idea. We've talked about the offensive line. We've talked about the defensive playmakers. The other thing that was curious to me is that he said the Cowboys have three offensive playmakers. Uh, he named Zeke, which we agree on, Amari Cooper, obviously. And then he mentioned Jason Witten. My question for you guys is, should the Cowboys go into this season expecting that Jason Witten will be a playmaker of that caliber for this team after being off for an entire year? No, I don't really think you can expect that. And I don't know if he was really a playmaker. He was not that caliber before years. he retired. So no, I don't I don't I wouldn't put him in there. Really? Mm -mm. I kinda I will make the argument that that's I do think maybe maybe not toward the end of right before he retired but there his career i think is marked by being that was what was so remarkable to me about him is he was a playmaker there were moments yeah. in games where teams wanted to take him away and they couldn't take him away he wasn't fast he wasn't quick but it just worked like he had a way of finding a way to get open right. and the ball gets to him and he makes the catch now he's not going to run for most times not going to run for some long run after the catch but he'll get you that needed first down at critical moments in games right so 
from that standpoint, I do think he was a playmaker. I just don't know that I think he is still a playmaker. That that remains right. to be seen for me. Yeah, I mean, he was one. I yeah. just I wouldn't put him in there right now. I think you're being liberal with the definition of playmaker. And Jason Witten has a useful purpose. And you, everything you just said is true. He can help this offense. He can know, like he's a genius. He's got a master's degree in route running and finding the open space. I didn't know they give those. They do. They do. Wow. Actually, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, it's hanging yep. over his locker. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's Tennessee. The, it's the nine Pro Bowl stars. That's, ah, yeah, there you go. Or there whatever. Go. 10, 11. Something I don't like even know. That. I don't count them anymore. Um, he can do all that stuff. He, he'll he be there on third down, and he'll probably catch somewhere between two and five touchdowns, which he well, only— Well, touchdowns w- have never been the big thing for him, I don't think. Which, well, you know? and again, what's what, what are we calling a playmaker? Like— I think a playmaker can be a guy that, in critical moments, moves the chains for you regularly. That's a playmaker, in my opinion. Playmaker, in my opinion, is a guy who, like, you hold your breath because when the ball's going his way, you don't know what's going to happen. Like, playmaker to me is like, oh, Dak threw this 18-yard pass to Amari Cooper, and now he's running 80 yards for a touchdown. Like, that's a playmaker. If that's the case, I don't know how in the world Bucky Brooks, Brooks, because that's never been Jason Witten's game, so how in the world could he put Jason Witten on that list? I think when you talk about him, you have to tie in Dak Prescott Mm -hmm. and what Jason Witten means to Dak Prescott, the safety blanket, the safety net. You're talking about Dak, the runner? Yeah. Yeah. I I thought that's where you were going. But go ahead. Finish your point. Go ahead. Well, just having him there, if whether that's catching or blocking, just having Witten there and what he means, how he helps Dak. And especially, like, for example, what he can do in the red zone, in the end zone, you know, where the Cowboys had so many troubles last year, plugging him back in, whether or not he's the one catching that ball, is still going to be a difference maker. I do there. agree with that. I agree with that. I agree too, with yeah. that. But I'm, what I'm saying is, is that he's he's putting all this. Well, your franchise quarterback is this. The reason why he would be in the conversation as a being a franchise quarterback is because he is an offensive playmaker. He is one of your guys. He and, and he's one of the guys that when you get down in the red zone, he needs to have you know his ability to roll out there and and make plays is is what you know the the, the pass to Beasley, one of his greatest plays. Ever against the Giants. I mean, it was his mobility to get out there, the arm strength to throw it rolling left like that. He probably could have run it as well. That's a playmaker. And um, you can't tell me that when Carolina was doing its thing a couple years ago that Cam Newton wasn't a franchise quarterback and an offensive playmaker for them. So, and other defense, when they're you know trying to plan what they're going to yeah. do on the field, they're going to pay more attention to Jason Witten than Blake Jarwin or yeah. Dalton Schultz or whoever else is in there. Difference maker, for sure. I yeah. Playmaker. Like, you know, back in the day, ESPN used to have a three-minute highlight package where they covered every single meaningful play in the game. And mm-hmm. now it's more like 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. If you're a playmaker, then your highlights are in that 20 seconds. You know what I mean? Like, you tell the story of the Eagles game in Amari Cooper plays. Oh, the big moments, yeah. You're not showing and, Jason Witten plays. You know, I mean, borderline guys, I mean, if, if Jason Witten was a playmaker at some point, Randall Cobb certainly was. That as well. And actually, that was, that was where I was going next. That's where I was going next. My question was going to be, from what we've seen so far, and I'll make the argument for two, do you think Gallup or Cobb ends up being really your third playmaker right. on this or, team, or on this Travion offense? Williams. Hey, well, I hope not. Then you draft him. I did, but I hope. I mean, if he is a playmaker for yeah. this team, that means Zeke's not on the field. Not no. necessarily. No. And I, I was going to go there some... next, but let's <laughs> okay. take one thing at a time. Do you think Cobb or Gallup jump around? No, you think <laughs> Cobb or Gallup have the potential based on what you've seen in their career so far? Yeah, um, have the potential to be that third playmaker for yeah, the Yeah, I do. I, I think Cobb has the, has the ability to be that guy, and I mean, I think Beasley was a, a playmaker at, at times. And and when you get Witten on there, you're going to get Amari, you're getting Zeke. You know, you can't cover everyone, and I still think Cobb has the ability to do some things like that. So I, I would put Randall Cobb in that ability. And who'd you say, Cobb? And Gallup. Gallup. And I actually think Gallup has, in my opinion, has more of an opportunity. You go to what Dave's definition of the playmaker, Mm -hmm. the guy that you see in those highlights. I know there were enough times last year when Cowboys took shots and there was an opportunity and it was just a little off. I expect that this year, those those times when it was a little off, they should be able to connect on those. And if they do that at that rate of the amount of times we saw it last year, Gallup will be a guy that is regularly being seen. He will be... For lack of a better way to put it, you're Alvin Harper. He will be a guy that can go downfield and make some plays 
and you're seeing it regularly, and defenses are now having to think about Michael Gallup's down the sideline. Somebody right. better be back there to make sure if he catches the ball, he doesn't end up in the end zone. True. I agree with that. And, I mean, Cobb, I hope I hope the Cobb signing pans out as well as I can, as well as it could, because you're talking about a guy that – averages 60 yards per for season for his career and that's with a couple of injury hobbled uh seasons 40 touchdowns 12 yards per per catch for his career again all all improvements over jason witten no disrespect to him but that's i mean he can do all the things cole beasley can and adds more of a big play and downfield element and i think that could be huge there's a lot to like about this Cobb. there is <laughs> what am i missing inside joke Okay. Nick likes to throw two or three of those in there. It yeah. wasn't inside. It was a outside You know what? Headline. I think it's very exciting when you look at this roster, especially in the off- on the offense, that it doesn't matter who's being blocked. Let's say Amari Cooper can't make a play or whatever. You feel good enough with whoever else is open that it would be able to catch that ball and do something with it. Yeah. As opposed to, let's say, last year where it was kind of like up in the air and you don't really trust many of those receivers that are at times. So now it's the point that you just feel good. You don't care. Just as long as one person is open and can do something, you feel confident. That's the pick your poison type of you know strategy. The, the, the weird thing about this whole off season is, is when you talk about offense, you got a lot of things to be excited about. But the last time they were on the field, they were pretty much shut down, at least from the running game. And everything we saw last year is different because there's a new coordinator. It's hard to build on that because you don't really know what Kellen Moore's how different he's going to be than Scott Linehan. You hope there are some some big differences, uh, especially with red zone play calling. So it's it's kind of hard. That's what's what's weird about this is that you you really can't build off of you know last year because you got a new play caller. Okay. Here's the the thing: as we went through this list, there seems to be two areas that probably we had the biggest questions about again I think we we kind of feel like there are answers for all of them but if you had to identify it would be the offensive playmakers the defensive playmakers so basically playmakers guys that are making big plays for you offensively or defensively my my own opinion of this is that when you're talking about the draft particularly when you're when you don't have a first round pick there are two positions I think that typically you can find good quality. You can probably throw offensive guard in there as well. But there are two positions where you can usually find good value second, third, fourth round, that being safety and running back. So let's talk about those two positions from the standpoint of the second round. Would you guys be willing to use a second round pick on a running back? I know what Stephen Jones says. He says you kind of ideally want your second round pick to be playing. But in a situation like this, where if you got a versatile running back who has the ability to do more than just line up in the backfield, maybe he lines up in the slot some, maybe he does some other stuff, he can spell Zeke at times, would you be willing to use a second-round pick on that kind of running back? What did you say the positions were? I'm sorry. The positions were— Running back and safety seem to be positions you can get value later in the draft, right? Exactly. Well, well, I disagree. Either of them later in the second round is what you're you're I disagree about safety completely, but— you, you disagree that, that there is value later in the draft? I think if you're trying to find a difference maker in terms of upgrading your roster at safety, it had better be a top 60 pick or even top 40. And so let me let me define that again. I may have mis, mis- said that. What I'm saying is in the second round, by the time the Cowboys pick, you could still find value at those yeah. two positions. Right. Good value, really you good just, value. You just As opposed to pass rushers? If you don't get him oh, in the no. top ten, you're probably not getting no. him. Right, right. With the safety, you got to hope that your defense can cover up his his flaws, whatever and, his flaws. He's is. got some, or he wouldn't last the fifty eight. Right. Did he not time fast enough? Does he did he not have a lot of interceptions? Is he kind of light? You know, does he not tackle? I mean, just things like that that that, that drop him. Which I guess you could make the argument with every position. I'm getting why, why I'm dropped. I'm getting ready to speak out of both sides of my mouth because I did mock Travion Williams to the Cowboys at pick number ninety, but. There's so much value to be found at that position that you should not have to do it at 58, especially when you already have an all pro on the team. And yeah, I mean, you might get a guy that can do all that stuff. You can find that guy in the fifth round too. Here's, here's why the caveat to that is this is a decision that needs to be made right now. And I'm sure it has been. This is Steven Jones, Jerry Jones, uh, Will McClay, Garrett, I guess. It's a philosophical decision. This is a, what are we doing with Ezekiel Elliott? Which, by the way, he did. They did give him his fifth year option today, um, which isn't you know that wasn't earth shattering. We knew that was going to happen. But are they planning on signing him? If they're like, you know what, we might just say let's go for two years and then we'll just see. If that's the case, then fifty eight makes it is a different 
But can you, do you have enough information to make that kind of decision right now? The argument I would make is for a running back, like it, the drop is precipitous and it happens quickly. And they're always, every time they touch the ball, there's a chance for injury. And that injury could change the complexion of who they are as a player. If you've got two years left on a deal with a running back, I would suspect that right now you cannot make a well-informed decision about what you're going to do in two years from now on a running back. Wow. That's fair. Because DeMarco Murray was basically like out of the league two years after he was NFL Offensive Player of the Year. And he was... He was older than Zeke at that point, much older. I think, like at least two or three. Todd Gurley is a good example. Yeah. What happened this year? Like by the end of the year, I, 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 and I don't know this. I just I've said it before. Like I feel like running back was making so much progress in terms of regaining some of its lost value, and all of a sudden, like people are worried about Todd Gurley's knee, and you're seeing it trend right back the other way. And Pittsburgh will just let Le'Veon Bell walk. I mean, like. Those kinds of things. In early February, to... or no, in early March, Stephen Jones said, like, you know, Gurley's the jumping off point for Zeke, and we'll get that done when we can. And they still might. I haven't heard anything to right. suggest that they won't, but they can change their mind. Nah, they, I, they got him under I, contract I, I just for think two more years. Both those examples aren't aren't really fair to Zeke because number one, yeah, they, they let Le'Veon Bell go and they missed the playoffs. I mean, like Le'Veon, that was a difference maker. This guy's led the league in rushing. Two out of the three years, he had the incident, which we all, well, I don't know, but I'm not putting words in anyone else's mouth, but I think it was a bogus uh, situation for him to be suspended for six games like that. This team did not make the playoffs, and he still almost had 1,000 yards. He is an absolute difference maker with no injury history like Todd Gurley. And just like Le'Veon Bell, when he wasn't in there, this team dropped off. So he's done everything he's supposed to do, and if you're going to make this deal, I would do it right now. I've said it several yeah, times. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I'm saying, though, that's if you're going to go ahead and re-sign him now so that you get the benefit of having a deal that doesn't start in two years. It starts now, right? right? So that, I agree with you. I'm saying if they're not ready to do that now, then I think you wait because I don't think you can – going back to your your the example you were given about the draft, I don't think right now they can say what's going to be the health of this running back in two years because the amount of times they gave him the ball last year – they keep up that pace. Mm. I don't trust it in two years. He's two years. He's going to be injury free because that's a ton. I mean, that's a word. And Jerry even talked about it in a couple press conferences ago, where he said, "Hey, a lot of times we gave him the ball. Like we got to do something different. We can't expect to to give him that workload. But if they don't, they don't get a viable secondary option, and they keep giving him that kind of workload. I don't trust it in well, two years. He's going to be healthy. You don't have, like Dave said, you don't have to go to the fifty eighth pick in the draft to get a solid. Uh, backup running back that can spell Zeke and run behind this line, you can get a guy in the fifth round that you would be impressed with and be like, oh, he's, you're not asking him to do a lot. We're asking him to get 10 carries, catch the ball a little bit, and he gets to run behind this line. He's he's pretty good. Take, yep. that to the, yeah. take that to the safety position. Would you guys be willing to look at 58 for safety? I think 58 is – I think I, safety is what they want you, to spend yeah, pick need, 58 you on. Need to get a, can you get a playmaking safety at 58? Probably not. If you get really lucky – that's, I mean, <laughs> how high do you have to go and get a playmaking safety? That, I mean, welcome to, and I'm not trying to be facetious, like, welcome to the debate we've been having on the draft show for three months because this is a deep safety class, but there is a drop off at a certain point, and it's right around where the Cowboys are picking. The caveat there is this is this is going to be one of the most unpredictable drafts in recent memory i think i mean the number one overall pick is probably going to be kyler murray but that's still in question like it, well i don't think it i think they're full of really? crap i think okay. the cardinals are full of crap i think they're going to pick him point being the guy that's probably going to go number one is like consensusly considered like the 15th best prospect in this draft so that throws everything off and then the number one prospect is is nick bosa he'll go right after that and then it's literally beauty in the eye of the beholder for the rest of the way down like you're seeing variances on grades between you know brian burns is a pass rusher that dane brugler thinks is the 10th best prospect in this draft brian Broadus thinks he's 50 uh and you see wow. va- you see variances like that that's huge disparity yeah. yeah you're talking i mean Let's go through the list of safeties. Taylor Rapp is considered like the most well-rounded safety in this class, but his he's ath- projected mid first round though, right? He's no, his his grade is everywhere from late first round to maybe the Cowboys could draft him because he ran a four seven forty. People are out on his athletic ability. Jonathan Abram, a guy the Cowboys are absolutely smitten with. Again, more of a box safety thumper. Doesn't have the range that makes him elite. So does he go in the first round? Probably not. He's probably pegged somewhere between. 
32 and 45. Uh, Juan Thornhill, his versatility. I've seen him everywhere from 35 to 65. Uh, Chauncey Gardner Johnson, the kid out of Florida, same thing. Like, it's all about who who's grading these guys. Would you be willing to jump up to forty five to get one of those guys no. you really love? It's the conversation we had last night. We did a seven round mock for the Cowboys. In this mock, which again we're going to be wrong. Like, there we're going to see guys going in the first round that we didn't expect. We're going to see guys falling. I'm very confident of that. But so you actually might get a really great player at another position that you didn't expect to be there, like a defensive tackle, which, where it's pretty deep, right? Completely explains why the Cowboys have done so much diligence with so many different positions. That's why running backs with high grades were brought in and wide receivers. Um, I really think safety and D tackle are the spots they're focusing in on though. Um, But so last night in this exercise, Taylor Rapp, who is most people's best all around safety prospect, he fell to, I think 49. And so you're faced with the prospect of, well, we'd love to trade a fourth round pick to go up and get this guy, but is that a is that enough of a price? Probably not, because it's all up to the team that's trading back. So are you willing to trade pick ninety to go get a guy you really love at forty nine? And that's maybe a decision they'll have to make. All right, let's go ahead and take our final break. We'll come back. Let's get some questions. Eight 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 five five two two nine seven is our number again. Eight 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 five five two two nine seven. We'll also ask these guys to give us a few names of guys that they will be watching this weekend, second and third rounds, and maybe even some sleepers. We'll do that when we come right back. This is DallasCowboys.com radio. While a player could look good on paper, it's when he's out on the field that you really find out what he's made of. That's why the Cowboys rely on more than just stats and scouting reports when building their team. When picking a tractor, it's why you should rely on more than just specs and features. You've got to take it out and put it to the test. The Cowboys did when they named John Deere their official tractor. Experience one for yourself. Visit myjohndeeredealer.com slash football. It's time for tailgate with the Otterbox boys. Otterbox? The makers of those crazy protective phone cases? The one and only. They're also wild about protecting parking lot parties from sad drinks. It's why they made Elevation Tumblers. Rumor around the Crock-Pot is they're made from stainless steel with a copper lining to keep temps hot or cold. True. They even come in seven different sizes, up to 64 ounce. The Growler. Hmm. I like how Otterbox drinks. I mean, thanks. And that's been tailgating with the Otterbox boys. Check out all the colors and sizes of their Elevation Tumblers at otterbox.com. Want to use what the pros use? How about the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys, Jack Black? Right now, you can get the Jack Black Playmaker, a curated collection of Cowboys locker room favorites for just 10 bucks with free shipping. The Playmaker includes four Jack Black skincare favorites plus a full-sized intense therapy lip balm and a Cowboys can cooler. Go to getjackblack.com slash cowboys and use the code word COWBOYS. The Jack Black Playmaker, 10 bucks, free shipping. Star Sports Tours is the only official fan travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys, offering exclusive game weekend travel packages with sideline access and photo ops with current players, alumni, and cheerleaders. That's not all, though. You'll get to talk X's and O's with Senior Director of Player Personnel, Will McClay, and, of course, with yours truly, me, Brian Broaddus. You can trust the official fan travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys, and with us, you'll travel like a pro. Visit CowboysTravel.com to book your travel package today. A man's Stetson doesn't just protect him from life's elements. It projects an unstoppable and legendary spirit, just like the men wearing silver and navy on the field every Sunday. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American-made with pride right here in Texas. They are still the official crown of all self-respecting cowboys. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Find Stetson hats in the pro shop or at Stetson.com today. Back to the break. Welcome back. It's the final segment of the break live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. And uh, we got, uh, we're talking about draft a little bit. We're talking about what you need, what the Cowboys need in order to make a Super Bowl contender, according to Bucky Brooks and his article on NFL.com. Um, we're going to take some questions. Numbers 888-855-2297. Uh, I guess let's go ahead and jump into that. And then we'll save it uh, for a little bit later for you guys to give us some names of some players uh, in this draft that, that fans should be looking forward to in the second, third round, and maybe even some sleepers. Um, let's take a call right now from David in North Carolina. David, what up? Hey, guys. How you doing? First Good. Off, are you thanks great. for everything you do. You guys do a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I've actually got a couple questions. Uh, my first question is, everybody seems to be talking about Joe Looney as a backup center, and nobody seems to be talking about him as a backup left guard. 
uh, why are they just giving that job to Connor? Seems like Joe would be in better. I mean, he'd be in tune with Travis Frederick because I mean, he spent so much time in the film room and playing center. Seems like he might be a better choice if you're going to put your best five linemen on on the uh, on the field. And then my second question is. It seems like the safety thing, I'm not totally sold on that because I haven't seen a team lose a Super Bowl because of a safety. But I've seen a team lose a Super Bowl because of defensive line play. So I just want to get your thoughts on that, and I'll hang up and listen to what you guys have to say. All right, thanks for the call. Saw a team win a Super Bowl because of a safety two months ago. McCourty, the play was unbelievable. Yep. I mean, incredible. And I have no faith that anybody on the Cowboys roster right now could have made it. What, um, what I he, do. Uh, I agree. I mean, line play. By and large, yes. Line play is much more important in the grand scheme. But in this defense, even three technique is probably one is, of the more important yeah. positions. This is a good football team right now. And it, it needs, you know, you're just finding a spot. That's where safety is. It's like, all right, where can they be better at? I mean, no one's talking. No one ever is talking about anybody going to the Pro Bowl at safety. Linebacker, they had one and almost two. They had a defensive line. They've got a receiver. They have a running back. They, you know, tied in. They're bringing one back. Quarterback is going. No one's ever had a Pro Bowl safety here for a long time. So, I mean, that's when you when good football teams are like, how can we make this even better? That's why safety is even an issue. And this is one of those positions that we've been talking about for a few years now to where it's like, okay, how can you upgrade it? Or when are you going to upgrade it? And it's kind of getting to that point i mean yes uh, last year they were able to manage through the year and before that season started we were all talking about safety yeah, yeah that we didn't were. happen and it, it, they went through it they made it work but when you're watching games and there is a bad play and you're like oh my god yes they do need a safety that that can do certain things and they don't have that it's when you know this time of the year comes around again and you start talking about it and you do want to address it because how many more years are you going to keep waiting on? Let's flip to the first part of his question about the offensive line, particularly Joe Looney. He says he thinks Joe Looney should be arguably your backup or uh, a backup guard. He said backup. I really think he meant starter. He said, Does he? Yeah, because he said, why are you just giving the job to Connor Williams? I don't think you'd be arguing about being a backup. I really believe that uh, what he meant to I say— I thought he made a mistake in thinking that Connor Williams was going to continue to be the backup as he was toward the— you know, about the middle of last year when he got hurt I, I um, and know. then came back. I, I think that I've heard this argument before is why is Joe Looney not being considered to start at left guard? And I really think that's what he was saying. If Do you really think he should? About, Let's take it from that standpoint. Yeah. You think he should? Um, I, no, I don't. I don't. I, cause I, I think what you're doing is, is, and that's not fair to him, but you know, you, you, I, I I believe that you're getting more out of your players by having a, a game day backup as a you know, a three p position backup center two guard spots. I think that's very valuable. You don't have that with Connor. You don't have that with Xavier Sulafilo. So if Frederick comes back, then Looney is a is a very valuable backup player. And this team wants to to be right. They want to show success in the draft, and they want to have Connor Williams be a, their starting left guard. That's what they want. Well, all teams do. I mean, yeah. you want to give your draft picks sure. a chance. And we just spent the first segment saying, you know, we got to wait and see on Travis. We're not ready to pencil him in as ready to be Travis Frederick. So I don't want Joe Looney to have to learn a new position if he's going to wind up being my starting center. I like having him there. You're right. He can play all three positions in a pinch. You also have Xavier Suofilo, who kind of becomes redundant if Joe Looney's starting at another position. And then Connor would naturally be his backup. So what do you do with Xavier? I mean, I don't want to cut him. Uh, so I think I think that's a good problem to have. I'm I'm banking on Connor continuing to improve. I like I don't think that was a bad pick at all. I'm completely not ready to. Yeah, like he's going to be fine, in my opinion. So they've got good depth and that's a good thing. Coming into this season, do you expect that Connor or Suofilo will be your starting left guard? I think Connor. I mean, part of it is, I hate to say politics because I don't think it's like Connor's not undeserving. Like he, what I thought what you said in the first segment was great. Like if that's his floor, he should be pretty good. Yeah. Um. So he's going to continue to get better. You want to be right. You want your draft picks to play the meaningful roles for you. That's how you win is cheap service for multiple years. I mean, Xavier's in a contract year now. Joe is too. 
Connor's got three more seasons to play. It yeah. just makes sense. And and so is Lyle Collins or Collins will be Lyle's in a contract yeah, year. Contract too. year. So that's an interesting part of this thing as well. I, I don't want to give up on Suafilo either. I thought that was a was a very good find. And I think, you know, he sometimes these players I just I just think a lot about Colombo with him. Drafted pretty high. Didn't really work out where you wanted it to be. Now you're kind of humbled a little bit. Get another start. Surround yourself with better players. And, and you know, you, you have a different outlook on things. Which, if Suofilo just completely outplays Connor in training camp, then I think he would be the starter. Yeah. But yeah. I am willing to give Connor Williams the benefit of the doubt that he will be better. Um, there is no reason why to think otherwise. I mean, when you watched Connor right. all of last year... You saw improvement game That's, after game. Even after he got hurt and went out, when he went in for Zach, he did a good job. And then when he got back in the position, when Suafilo mm-hmm. went out with an injury, he was able to perform perform a lot better. So it's, he's one of those players, rookie last year, okay, young, and that you're seeing development and progress. So there is nothing that he just kind of... right. Went backwards. But on. Suafilo is, was drafted even higher in his round a few years before that, and he's considered to have just as much, if not more, talent. So, you know, yeah. he could play right in, next to Frederick and, and Tyron Smith and play well, too. So it's a good problem to have. And something yeah. really special about Suafilo is how much he cares, how passionate he is about the game. It, it may not seem like it, but when you look at him around the locker room and talk to him or whatever, just the fact that he would walk in, and I would see him. I talked to him a lot. He would walk in and be kind of upset. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? And he's like, yeah, I just I wasn't good enough out of practice. And, like, those little things that even at practice, I'm like, well, it's just practice. This is the time to make mistakes. It's like, no, 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 that's not how you have to look at it. This is like you have to take it as a game day and just perform how you need to perform. There's no room for mistake because that whole thing was happening with Connor, and there is that debate. So... Also, his job was kind of on the line or like the starting position. So when you see his, uh, players care that much, it, it it shows. It starts to translate on the field. And I think those kind of attitude, it's very they, important. They've got a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of guys there on the offensive line. And, I mean, don't want to take this show to another level, but if there is a player that you wanted to pick and you needed to trade somebody, I mean, have y'all even had that – if y'all even had that discussion of which player on this team, let's say you really wanted a, a third round pick. We did it with Tank, but that was before he signed his deal. Not really. I mean, I think the only positions you could probably look at where you just have kind of this, I think this dearth of riches is probably offensive line. You could make the argument that a pass rusher, maybe if you wanted, if a you third could get round some value for somebody like Taco, about but Taco, Collins. I don't think you could. You Malik, know? Lyle, Lyle. That's where I was going. Lyle would be the guy. I, I don't really love plug this. in a right tackle. Well, I mean, I, I you gotta again, you do that, and then Travis Frederick is not healthy, right. and then you gotta. <laughs> and now everything's that. off, and you're like, so, where well, we thought we were great, yeah, now you got. I'm nothing. just talking here. I, I think that I would be a spot, nothing, but but I, I I wouldn't do it because I'd also be curious I'm, to see what you could get for a guy with one year on his deal. It's true. I don't know. I mean, maybe you could get a third. Maybe I I kind of. I kind of doubt it. I don't yeah, know. I think it's throwing yeah, a talk. I, I don't know. Uh, anybody that you would actually want to trade, I don't know if you could get that big a compensation pick for. Maybe if you if you thought, hey, we are we know from our money standpoint we're not going to be able to, to re-sign Byron Jones, Byron Jones would be a guy that maybe you consider, but you better be drafting somebody because All right, now you, now you got a problem. Uh, now you got a problem. No, you don't, you don't mess with a second there. Byron Jones Just leave is, it alone. Byron leave Jones it. is moving around the facility on crutches right now. Like, what are you going to get for him? And that's, that's true. The harsh... That was a whole, a whole problem with Tank, too, right? People had that, that argument about what happened uh, with, with a guy from Seattle that got traded. And right. Could you get the same compensation for Tank? Well, the problem was Tank had a bum shoulder. And that always affects what you're going to get in compensation. It's I'm losing cr- t- track of time right now. So, Taco, third year? Are we on Taco third? Taco is entering his third year. Entering third. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward two years, or one year. Fast forward one year, do you think that the Cowboys will be giving Picking him a up fit? his option? If I had to guess, no. But, but you know what? No. Like, we didn't think they would pick up Byron Jones exactly. or Claiborne. True. You're right. Yeah. No, and I think in those situations, that's where you wait to see, like, Okay, is this the year when it starts to pop for him? Is this the year when everybody's like, man, that was a bum pass? I still don't understand what happened last year. Kind of, it was Parcells that said by the third year, right? I mean, that's the the big the 
Oh, before you get somebody crazy on Twitter, because he got that from Tom Landry. So sorry, I sorry, know. Tom Landry. I'm just saying you will get that if you say that that was Parcells' thing. But yeah, a lot of great Hall of Fame coaches have have made that and agree with it. By the third year, it's going to click or it doesn't. But I will say this: I think the the caveat to that is by the third year, you will probably find out if you're going to have a great player or not. I don't know if it necessarily means because you can point to a lot of op, a lot of situations where. By the third year, you don't get a great player. But by the fourth year, you got a guy that's like, oh, he's pretty good. His name like, is he may Tank not Lawrence. be, yeah, he may not be all pro, but he's a guy that's pretty good. So I don't know that that always works, right? From the standpoint of just saying if you're going to get a really good player well, versus a that's kind of what happens when player. you're nearing the end of your contract stuff. It kind of the light bulb Sometimes, just, all it all just sudden, turns you on. I can't, out. I can't get over the fact of healthy scratch. Healthy scratch. You were That's healthy. You were ready to go. By the way, at were, a position that rotates. Right. It's a rotational right. position. And they said, we don't need you today. <laughs> we don't need What you. happened? I still don't know. I mean, Marinelli doesn't really care who was drafted what or where and all that. He just says, let's, let's go out here and play. And he wasn't really helping them. So, and, that, and that's think, the part that worries you. I that's think he was the part that worries you. You know, he was banged up a little, but um, the trainers will tell you, like, no, he was he was ready to go. And, you know, so he that's the start. I mean, forget being great, being good. How about just playing by like being on the field and then we'll work from there? He's He's got a long ways to go before he is a productive player, I think. Yep. Real quick before we end the show, uh, I do want to give you, give you guys an opportunity to throw out some names of guys here in the second and third round. Cowboys won't be picking until Friday unless they move up into the first round which would take a ton of resources, oh. which I don't think probably is going to happen. But all that being said, Extras one. second and third year, maybe, second and third year, so second and third round picks that will happen on Friday. Give me some names of some guys uh, that fans should be paying attention well, to. Well, we, we have a, um, a video that, that we will produce, I, I believe today. If not today, it'll be tomorrow. Uh, and it was the four riders doing a second and third today. round mock draft today. 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 Okay. Uh, awesome. And, and I... I don't mind previewing that a little bit. Some yeah. of the, some of the names, I, I, from my standpoint, I went with Juan Thornhill, the safety from Virginia. Um, what which, does he do well? He his versatility is great. Uh, he's played corner. He's had been had interceptions at corner. He's had interceptions at safety. He can. He's really good at tackling behind the line of scrimmage. I think he anticipates really well. Uh, it's got that decent size. A little lanky for a safety, but boy, Chris Richard would snatch him up to be a corner. What? So, what does he not do well? Um. You know, why is he in the second round? I well, guess probably when you're a jack of all trades, you're a master of none. So I think that's probably he's not a shut down corner and he's not a ball hawking safety. He's you know, but he uh, does get to the ball. He had six yeah. interceptions last year. I mean, you know, so he can make plays. He, he would, Again, guy, that playmaker. I, you're I, I'll for. say this: I don't think, and I know the guys that study this, they really don't think he's a he's a he's a fifty eight. They think. It's it's hard. You get to probably this probably yeah, earlier than that. You get to this earlier time, than that. Okay. Yeah, he's probably not gonna be there for the end. You get to this time of year, and the team that's picking tenth overall is like nobody's getting to us. We're gonna have to settle on a guy we don't love. Which right, like looking at it right now, I don't feel great about what might be there for him. But who knows? You know, that's what I'm saying. Like the the very there's so much variation. The grades are all over the board. I think it's gonna be wild. I think it's gonna be fun. I think if they had their way, they would draft a safety. Juan Thornhill's a guy to watch. I mocked them Chauncey Gardner Johnson out of Florida. Don't think that'll happen either. Um, Darnell Savage is a guy to watch. Uh, Taylor Rapp and Jonathan Abram, if for some reason they were to fall, I think they're like 1A and 1B. Um, and if they can't get a safety, then I think they'll be looking at defensive linemen. Jalen Ferguson out of Louisiana Tech is a guy. Tristan Hill out of UCF is a guy. Uh, I think those are two big names worth circling. And Everyone knows this team needs a safety. They've talked about it so many times. So if you're sitting at 58 and here's a guy you like at 52, 53, I mean, what's it going to take to get up there? A fourth rounder? Conceivably, yeah. Because you know someone's going to going to try to j maybe jump you and go, oh, we want a safety too, but you got to get in front of Dallas. So even though they try to say, wow, we don't need a safety. We don't need a safety. We got George <laughs> Iloka. I mean, we, we, we're good there, but... Uh, 
I don't know. And without a first round pick, this is what happens a lot of times. This team will go backwards. Mm-hmm. We think they're going to go up. They might even go Which, backwards to try to stock because they're like, things. if we need a safety, we just got to get above Dallas. As long as we stay ahead of Dallas, we can get the guy maybe we want. Right? Because ten years ago, I mean, you just kept going back. You just kept getting twelve picks, and surely if you pick twelve guys, somebody's going to be a stud. That could, honestly, <laughs> if if they were to do that, it wouldn't bother me because. The options that I think are going to be there for him at 58 are not great. But if you could trade back to 65 and add another pick or two in there, then I feel better about it. You know, Tristan Hill is a guy like 58 sounds rich for me, but I'm listening in the 60s. Maybe it just like I said, like we did a mock draft on the show last night and like halfway through it, I was like, I don't love what we're coming we away get, with here. We, get in the, in the we mock, got mock we got draft. Tristan Hill, Travion Williams. Uh, we took a safety and a pass rusher in the fourth. Um, added a special teams linebacker in the seventh. Our fifth round pick. Oh man, I'm drawing a blank. I think we got a wide receiver. Are you drinking at this place? I was. Yeah, yeah that's I what was. it seems like. <laughs> no um, names. I mean the <laughs> the big ones. The big ones were Tristan Hill. Did you see the video yesterday? I didn't. Okay. The big ones were Tristan Hill and Travion Williams, which. You know, again, you're talking about value. You're picking at the end of the round. So pick right. pick 90 is basically a fourth-round pick. It's higher than I would want to pick a running back. But Travion Williams led the SEC in rushing. He's an all-around guy. I think he could step right in and play if, for some reason, Zeke was unavailable. It's not what I would prefer to do. But, again, you're at, you're at the mercy of what so many other teams do that, first of all, it's incredibly hard to forecast, and beggars can't be choosers. So – uh, it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be fun because uh, there's going to be so many surprises, so many unpredictable things happen, and I think it'll be even more so this year. So, hell, maybe they'll come away with a safety. I just say I this: the the beauty of what they did in free agency um, is that they've they've basically cleared up all their holes. So, to me, don't be afraid to take even if it's in the second round. If you're run, if the running back that's on the board is so much better than any other position, don't be afraid to take the pick because I think right now they can only get better by getting more talent yeah. of playmakers, right? So, and you can find a way to figure out how to get them into the into the game and, and use them. The only position that you can't do that is quarterback. Every other position you can rotate. Mm. So try, get the best available player. And if you do that, I think they'll come out of this draft. I fine. agree with, I would feel so much better if they did that with a wide receiver. That's what I've been saying all along. Debo Samuel from South Carolina. If he's is my there guy. and he's the best guy, go, go I, for it. I don't think they will. And maybe I, they won't. I, I think, think they are hell bent on coming away with a defender at pick 58. I think and that's I where think I think the, you get into problems. The sneaky need trouble. here is cornerback. I really do. I think that it's, it's something not, to consider. That's it it yeah. just be, you don't know what, what's going to happen with Byron. You don't know, you know, with with uh, Jordan Lewis and uh, you know Anthony Brown will be a free agent. I, I think you, you need to look at corner, and that that's why those two we just talked about Thornhill. And Gardner Johnson are are safety slash corners, and it's like you're getting a poor man's Byron Jones kind of. Richard's been scouting corners for the last two months, so don't forget Alumba. Nothing should surprise you. I like Alumba. And don't stink her. The only thing that should surprise you is if they draft a quarterback. That's and the only kicker. thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's my point. I don't even think that would be that surprising. LSU kicker. I mean, they could, I, I don't think they will, but. All right, we appreciate you guys joining us. We'll be back next week. Uh, make sure you take t- stay tuned for all of our draft coverage coming up tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday. We appreciate you guys joining us. Till then, for Nick Eatman, Dave Hellman, Amber Garcia, I'm Derek Eagleton. This has been The Break, live on DallasCowboys.com radio. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about you, Cowboys? Yeah!